if only our founding fathers had been Christian. <laughs> Just a wee bit of sarcasm in that. Uh, not all of them were the Christians that we would say are true Christ followers, but in so many ways, in so many ways. And that's what we're here to talk about today. Again, good to see you. It was pretty cool uh, having that wedding last night on the shores at, at Myrtle Beach at about, uh, about 6.30 and finishing up about 7, a little after, and then driving home because somebody said, did you miss not seeing the fireworks? And I saw fireworks from <laughs> Conway all the way to China Grove last night. And in fact, this, you know, I saw the legal ones that towns were doing and I saw the illegal ones that different individuals were doing uh, in both states. It was pretty cool, pretty neat thing to see. Uh, I want to tell you first, as we go through different scriptures today, I'm going to take you through several and you see some of them listed in the bulletin. If you are one who does the uh, Bible note taking, you want to go ahead and head to those, you find them. Uh, the slides are a little bit sketchy and it's not because of Greg or Bill or any of those back there on the slides today, the production team. It's because of the pastor. And the pastor was really, really uh, wrestling with this message yesterday afternoon and uh, even up until this morning I've got the ink marks to prove it on my hand but uh, it was in a it was evolving in a good sort of way I hope we'll see but uh, they don't have the slides they don't have a lot of the of the quotes that are there or the uh, scripture passages so look them up for yourself and what I'm going to try to do is I know there are a lot of folks who are not here and they are recording this of course we are gonna, I'm going to try to make this available in print too, but I've got to do some, needless to say, some big time editing on that before that's done. So again, keep up, I'm saying the old-fashioned way today, all right? Just pretend there's no screen, but when those uh, quotes do come or the scripture comes, you can check it out then, all right? Having said all that, we got a lot of ground to cover. And since last week, in mentioning what I was going to be speaking of today, many of you have sent me emails, you've texted me, you've given me resources, and I want to tell you, there is not enough time in the next 10 minutes to cover the ground, <laughs> to cover the ground that we're going to be covering. So we are going to be doing some more work on this in the weeks to come, I promise you. We might have to just break a little bit on Hebrews to do this, but there are a lot of things that need to be said, need to be said now, all right? All right, let's pray, and then we dig. Father, before you we bow. Father, to imagine the first Supreme Court Justice, John Jay, saying something like, the leaders in this nation should be Christian. Lord, if any of those nine justices in Washington, D.C. said anything even slightly aligned to that today, they would be out for blood. They would be out to impeach them, to get them to resign in whatever way possible, Lord. Father, if, if someone like a George Washington or a Benjamin Franklin even, those folks, Lord, even those who might be considered less religious than others would say what they said today that they said then, Lord, they would be looking for nooses to hang them. But Father, we come to you knowing that the greatness of this nation was not founded upon the loose talk of today. The greatness of this nation was founded upon men and women who not only lived out what they believed to be true, but also sought to share what to be true with others. And so, Lord Jesus, we come to this today. May we get a hint of our nation's history of the past. May we get a hint of what you intend for us to be, but may we also get a hint of where we're going and what could happen if we don't show up and be the church you've called us to be. And so, Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts together be acceptable in your sight because you are our only rock and our only redeemer, and it's in your name we pray. And all of God's people say, amen. Over the past three weeks, I have... Uh, performed a marriage ceremony each weekend. And uh, in those three ceremonies, just like this, 
we might do this the old-fashioned way without screens and microphones in just a few moments. So uh, we'll see what happened. I might have hit something back there. Um, in those three ceremonies, I introduced them in the opening sentences the way I've introduced a, a wedding or a marriage ceremony for the last 29 or almost 30 years. And it's the way the, that many thousands of pastors have done so for years, and there's a good reason. Because the opening sentences of almost every wedding service, in fact, most of the ones that you were a part of as well, uh, they are in the Book of Common Worship. They have been passed down by folks who believed in the authority of Scripture. And to open a marriage service with those words were to open it with God's favor and blessing upon it. Hear these words. You might recognize them. Marriage is a relationship which has been established by God and is governed by His commandments and blessed by our Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to hear them again. Marriage is a relationship which has been established by God, is governed by His commandments, and blessed by our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, class, I want to take this apart for just a second because there seems to be some trouble with this. I'm getting static, Lynn. Let me just, I can cut this one off and go with just this one. Let me just go with the lectern mic. All right, let's take this apart and look at it phrase by phrase for a second. And as we do so, I want to show you in Scripture where it comes from. Marriage is a relationship. The question is, between who? Most likely we already know the answer to that, but let's look at what God has to say in Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1 says this, verse 21 and following. Genesis, or, I'm sorry, Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2, verse 21 and following. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he, he took one of the man's ribs and closed up the place with flesh. And then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. You're saying, preacher, that you believe that, that, God, that God created a woman out of a man by taking a rib from him? Yeah, I do. Until I'm told differently, I do. And until I'm told differently, not by the world or you, until I'm told differently by the Creator, I believe this. Because I seem to think of it this way. Is it easier to believe this or to believe that somehow, some way, everything just happened by coincidence? And somehow, some way, a glob of protoplasm decided to get up out of the ocean one day and walk. I think I'm going to go with this and for now, okay? All right, so this is where that first phrase comes from. Let's look at the next phrase. Marriage is a relationship which has been established by God. Turn back to chapter 1 now, verse 27 and 28. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Isn't that interesting? How many times does he have to tell us who was created there? Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. And now notice who rules what. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves on the ground. So marriage is a relationship which has been established by God and then is governed by his commandments. If you would, you don't have to go through scripture on this one. Just hear me out because there are many that commandments throughout scripture that deal with marriage, that deal with relationships. Exodus 20 verse 14, you shall not commit adultery. There's one commandment. Ephesians 5.21, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Ephesians 5.22, wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. Ephesians 5.25, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church. Those are the commandments. And then that final phrase, and blessed by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Go to Matthew 19, if you would, on that one. Matthew 19, Jesus says this, haven't you read? That at the beginning the Creator made them male and female. And he said, For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh, so that they are no longer two but one. Therefore what God has joined together, let man not separate. Words from marriage ceremonies. Opening words of a marriage ceremony from folks who came up with those words out of Scripture, believing that what God designed, he defined. 
what God def- designed, he defined. That they believed in something even higher than just this thing called marriage. They believed in something we call the authority of Scripture. That what this book says is true. That it's real. That we can use it in all manners of faith and practice. In fact, we can use it as our final authority. This book was the primary guide for so long. You see, once upon a time, once upon a time, there were generations who actually believed this was real and that you could follow its rules and that life was going to be better because you followed the rules. Not because it was a man-made book, but because it was God's word. It was God-breathed, if you would. Once upon a time, there was a a nation of believers who who held so tightly to this notion that what God said he means, that they actually endured persecution and they took the risk. But go back even further. Once upon a time, there were people thousands of years ago who believed what this said and did the same thing. And at the risk of their families being sold into slavery and being separated forever, at the risk of them losing homes and businesses and everything they had, at the risk of horrible torture and persecution, and at the risk of death itself, they continued to share the message. And because of some of these folks who believed in this word so strongly, they decided to leave home. And they went to other places, and they went to other lands that, get this, other lands that already worshipped other gods... And they said to themselves, this is the one true book. This is one true word. We're going to share it. And they traveled to these other nations, to these other peoples, even though other faiths already believed what they did and they might offend someone. Did they think of compromising what they believe? Did they think that maybe this other nation has a little bit of truth and we have a little bit of truth, so let's put this truth together and we're going to come up with a, a, a lot more truth? No. Did they think of offending someone? Possibly could have at some point. But they did it anyway. They shared the word anyway. And the gospel of Christ spread throughout this world and Christ's followers risked everything to share it. Fast forward 1,700 years or thereabout. You got the late 1700s and there are a group of men who are bent over around several tables in different locations, in different places, in different times. But they're getting the ideas together of what this nation is to be about. Those men who, who you saw on the screen just a few moments ago, those men we sing about, that we've known about, that many of us back in the old day, once upon a time, we learned about in history classes. And they're huddled around these tables and they're trying to decide exactly what the founding documents are going to say. What's going to bring this country together and keep it together? I love that quote from Ben Franklin that said, if we, basically, if we don't do anything, if we don't look at Scripture, if we don't look at God's inspiration, we're going to be doing a work that's just as much in vain as those who built the Tower of Babel. And so they huddled there and they began to bring together their ideas and it's amazing what was the basis for their ideas? God's word. In much of what they said, God's word. You see, through the many debate today whether we were formed as a Christian nation or are we a Christian nation, you don't even go there. Don't even go there. I think we all can agree that whether we were a Christian nation or are a Christian nation, we were certainly founded on Judeo-Christian principles and beliefs and scripture and the word of God. We can look at the speeches shared. We can look at the correspondence that they sent to one another. We can look at documents that they wrote and find this to be true. And because they believed that, they had no problem whatsoever using God's word as a basis for their thoughts and ideas as they brought this country together. I've got, I have got. had several uh, quotes that I was going to share with you, tell you what, we will put those in the uh, in the final draft so that you can see them later. But for time's sake, I just want to hit one that really grabbed my attention. As I'm going through these quotes, and I've done this every time I do a sermon like this, a message like this, I gather quotes from founding fathers and from historical figures through the years to show us the Christian basis, the the thought behind who we are and where we are as a country. But one grabbed my attention, and it was because it was from an individual that wasn't as known as being that religious. His name was Thomas Jefferson. 
And Thomas Jefferson has been debated whether he was even a Christian or not. What he did, he took the Bible and basically he took out the parts he didn't like. He, it was, it's known as the Jefferson Bible. And basically he brought it together again and he said, this is the part I believe. What was interesting, what Jefferson was really uh, had a problem with, what he had a problem with was the corruption that was in the organized church and with Christians who he saw being very hypocritical as such. But in his own personal Bible, he wrote, I am a follower of Jesus Christ. So you can debate whether he was Christian or deist or whatever you want to say, but this quote, this quote was amazing to me and sort of, as some of you saw it on Facebook, has been the basis for this message and bringing it together. He said this, God who gave us life gave us liberty. And can the liberties of a nation be thought secure when we have removed their only firm basis, a conviction in the minds of the people that these liberties are the gift of God, that they are not to be violated but with his wrath? Indeed, I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just, that his justice cannot sleep forever. Jefferson went on to point out that if this nation ever did come to a point where we forget or rejected that conviction that God is behind this thing, that God is the giver of these gifts, that God is the, the, the giver of the freedom that we have. He said that at that point, that maybe even God would not step in to help us if we forgot that. That maybe God's hand of blessing might be removed and nothing would be able to save us. Church, I got news for you. What Thomas Jefferson wrote several hundred years ago, it's not new. It's not new. It comes straight from God's word. And God basically tells us, you follow me, you walk with me, I'm going to bless you. You turn away and you reject me, and I'm going to curse you. My hand's going to be taken off of you. I want you to see several places. Leviticus is one that I want you to see. Uh, when we get through, I'm really thinking after Hebrews, we get through with the Hebrew series, we're going to do a series on Leviticus. And <laughs> we will thin the place out pretty quickly on this one. But Now, we don't go there very often, and for a reason sometimes. But I want you to see this. Leviticus chapter 26, verse 13 and following. This is God speaking to Moses. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt so that you would no longer be slaves to the Egyptians. In other words, I am the one who gave you your freedom. I broke the bars of your yoke, enabled you to walk with your heads held high. But if you will not listen to me and carry out these commands, and if you reject my decrees and abhor my laws and fail to carry out all my commands and so violate my covenant, that's what Thomas Jefferson was getting at in that, in that quote, then I will do this to you. I will bring upon you sudden terror, wasting diseases and fever that will destroy your sight and drain away your life. You will plant seed in vain because your enemies will eat it. I will set my face against you so that you will be defeated by your enemies. Those you hate who hate you will rule over you and you will flee even when no one is pursuing you. Whether symbolic or truly physical and real, these things happen in Israel's life. The Lord said to Isaiah, if you are willing and obedient, you will eat the best from the land. But if you resist and rebel, you will be devoured by the sword. And then to the church in Ephesus, Jesus said this in Revelation, yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. Remember the height from which you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove the lampstand from its place. You know, I don't think that you have to look real hard if you put this scripture together to see that the first love this country and its leaders once had for God and his word is being forsaken in huge ways today. I want you to think about this. You've heard the news. You know it happened. But I want to bring it to mind again. A week and a half ago, five individuals, five justices that sit on our Supreme Court, five attorneys, basically, not, not voted in, not, not, not approved by the people, but appointed. Five of these men legalized, I, mean, I should say, I'm sorry, not men, women included, legalized same-sex marriage. 
legalize something that had been outlawed that had been not even thought about for centuries. As John Piper describes, and I love how he put it, instead of embracing the authority of God's word, chose to create a massive institutionalization of sin. Five justices redefined the definition of marriage that has stood for thousands of years. And my friends, not just for 300 and plus million people here in the United States who are living now, but for generation and generation and generation to come. You see, what God had designed and defined, all of a sudden we started to say to ourselves, maybe we can redefine it. Maybe some would say God didn't really design it in the first place. Maybe it's something humanly created and therefore we have the right to do that simply to appease a small minority of the population. And because of this, my friends, let me be prophetic in a little ways. Here's what we're looking at down the road. Here's what we're looking at down the road. Most every aspect of your life and mine will change. Now, Roe v. Wade in 1973 was a slap in God's face, I believe. That's when we said we don't believe in the sanctity of life. We can handle it ourselves. We can deal with it. We don't need God involved. But this is even more of a slap in, your, in God's face, I believe, because it's going to affect everything. You don't believe it? Let me mention some things. School systems. Many of you are teachers in the schools. You work administrated in the schools. Many of you have kids in the school or grandkids. School systems will see revised definitions of marriages in textbooks and lesson plans. You don't believe it? Fairfax County, Virginia school board did not take but a moment or two after that decision last week to revise their curriculum for 7th graders in Fairfax County. It now includes gender identity curriculum. School teachers will face the pressure to speak favorably about same-sex marriage and orientation. So a younger generation coming along, they will just think it's the norm. They'll just think it's the norm. In the workplace, tolerance and affirmation to same-sex marriage and orientation will be promoted and expected among employees. And if you do not confirm, if you do not affirm these things, you will be hit with, here it is, here's what we're hearing today. You are causing a hostile work environment. That's the quote. Christian business owners such as florists and bakers and photographers who refuse to do services or events, weddings for, for same-sex couples will be fined or forced to stop providing services for such events. That's already happening. You see the news this week? couple who owned a bakery started a little startup bakery in Oregon. They refused to make a cake for a lesbian couple's wedding. They were fined this week $135,000 by the court, by the court. It's put them out of business. It's put them out of business. Churches that offer their facility to non-members will be pressured to open their facilities to the public no matter what the occasion might be under, get this, here's a new term you're going to learn in the days to come, public accommodation laws. 20 states already have these on the book and it includes sexual orientation as a protected class. Faith-based institutions and organizations such as Christian schools and hospitals and mission organizations will be forced to comply with equal opportunity hiring. And of course, for the church itself, it gets personal for us, right? For churches and religious nonprofits that fail to change their views, you can bet your bottom dollar that over the next several years, you're going to see court battles over tax-exempt status. You see, the battle is on, friends. The battle is on, and it's not stopping with that decision that was made last week. A press release stated this week, unless there is a great spiritual awakening in America, the battle for traditional marriage is over. Now the battle for religious freedom has begun. But the decision made last week is just the tip of the iceberg. Many of us saw it coming. Many of us thought it would at some point down the road. But I want you to tell, there are other signs that let us know we have replaced our first love, if you would. Plenty of other signs. 
You see, once upon a time, our national leaders could share their faith as our forefathers did. There's, they could share scripture. They could share a word about a testimony from Jesus Christ. Today, politicians steer clear of anything dealing with their faith because they don't want to offend and they want the votes. Once upon a time, governmental buildings and memorials and monuments were inscribed with scripture passages and references to God. Today, there is every effort possible to take those inscriptions off of the monuments and especially not to create a monument with any of them on them. And if you want to put quotes around your walls at work or at school, you can use words from business leaders all you want. You can use politicians from around the world all you want. Quote them all day long. You can use actors and actresses and entertainers. Quote them as well. But don't you dare put one from the greatest man that ever walked the earth, Jesus Christ. Once upon a time, prayer could be shared in public gatherings, in governmental meetings, in public schools, before a football game. Today, those who would try that are threatened with lawsuits in jail. While students graduating from some high schools are being told, don't even mention God in your speeches. Once upon a time, the church influenced culture and it showed. Now the culture influences the church and it shows. Once upon a time, those in the church held firmly to the convictions that God's word was the last word. It was the authority. It gave us direction. It guided our feelings. It shaped our opinions. Today, it's culture that does that, and God's word is hidden as best as possible. President Ronald Reagan once described the United States of America as a city, a city, a shining city on a hill. I got a question for you Are we losing the shine? Are we losing the shine? It's a legitimate question. As much as I hope and pray we're not, I think it's a legitimate question. Given the fact that last week's decision affirmed once again what many of us believe, that instead of running towards God, we're doing all we can to run away from Him. Instead of promoting Him and putting Him up in front of the public eye, we're doing everything to hide Him. So is there any question why we should not expect, church, for God to show up one day and simply say something like this? You've forgotten your first love. America, I'm removing the lampstand. I'm removing the blessings you've enjoyed. I'm taking it away. You wanted me out of your lives. I'm going to be a gentleman and honor your request. God could do that, couldn't he? He has every right to do it. He did it to his own chosen people. But until he does... And or until he returns or takes us to be with him, we got to be the church that God intended for us to be. We can't stop it. And so that means several things. First, we got to trust the one who's in control even when it looks like things are out of control. Now, I confess, when I, when I heard the decision Friday a week ago, I got sick to my stomach. I knew it was coming. I, 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 it did not surprise me, disappointed me, yes, but I, got, I went into a funk. I was not fun to be around. Dawn and the girls recognized that as well. You know, I sort of felt like Elijah. That story came to mind. Remember, Elijah goes into the, the cave when Queen Jezebel is trying to catch him, and he's trying to run and hide, and he throws a little pity party for himself, and he looks at God and says, God, you know, I'm the only one who has not bowed the knee to Baal. I'm the only one who has stood for you, and look how I'm being treated. And he did that little pity party long enough until God got tired of it. And God comes by, and he calls Elijah forth. And you remember what he said to Elijah? He says, Elijah, I want you to listen to yourself because you're wrong. Because just over the hills there, just over the hills, I've got 7,000 people, believers, who have not bowed the knee to Baal. They've not, so you're not alone, Elijah. You're not alone. I sort of felt like Elijah when he did that because God sort of hit me between the eyes as well. And he said, David, and I really recognized this last night too because here's the deal. I was coming back from Myrtle Beach and driving through all these little small towns and these little places, the rural places as well that takes you through from South Myrtle here. And, and you're seeing church after church and church. And so I just started, still working on this in my mind, I just started praying for churches. And I started praying for pastors when I would pass a church. And I don't know where they stand or what they believe in, but I'm praying truth is taught there and Jesus is lifted up and so forth. And God hit me between the eyes again last night the same way he did this week. 
And what he told me was, David, I want you to know you're not alone. You're not alone. Because across this nation are thousands upon thousands of churches that have not bowed the knee to Washington, D.C. And they've not bowed the knee to Hollywood. And they've not bowed the knee anywhere else but to me. You're not alone. Church, we've got days of trusting to do, and we've got to do it. Lessons that Elijah learned, well, there were several. Lessons to keep his trust high, that when you're with God, you may be outnumbered, but you're never outmatched. That's a great lesson. You may be outnumbered, but you're never outmatched. And then when you're on God's side, as he told Gideon, the battle isn't yours, Gideon, it's mine. I'll do the fighting. I want you in on it. You got to be participating. You got to be a soldier in it. But it's going to be mine. The victory is going to be mine. So believe that, church. Secondly, stand firm because of it. Stand firm. In times like this, we need the body of Christ to stop retreating when the darkness invades. We need the church of Christ to stand. We need to stand firm. We don't need to give up any territory that doesn't belong to the darkness, to the evil one. A lady recently took the old hymn, Onward Christian Soldiers. She penned some new words to it. She wrote, Backward Christian soldiers fleeing from the fight with the cross of Jesus hidden from all sight. You know, that's a sad commentary on the church today, but it's also a fitting description of a good many churches and churchy people who sit by and let someone else fight the battles while they sit on the sidelines who sit by and wish we could help, wish we could do something. Aren't we sad that things are going the way they're going and we allow others to do what we should be doing? We admire those churches across the oceans that stand up and take a firm, you know, a firm stand for Christ when they're being pushed. We're inspired by the stories of Christians who were beheaded but never rejected Christ. We're moved by testimonies of believers who have had their homes burned, their businesses taken from them, their families ripped apart, all because they never denied their Lord. And we applaud them and we get inspired. We get teary-eyed just telling their stories. But in this country, we skip church if there's a little drizzle outside. We don't put everything we should in the offering plate because we got other things to do. We skip out on some of the, somebody said skips out on, on some of the prayer meetings and the Bible studies if there's no food involved. In this country, it's a little bit different. We who have, you know, you would think less to sacrifice, but I want you to know, if we aren't willing to sacrifice the less, there's going to be a day very soon when the more is going to be required. How many believers, how many of you or me will continue to give What you give to the church right now, if they come and say your tax exemption no longer in effect, what you give to the church is no longer a tax deduction, are you going to give the same thing to the church that you give now? How many of us are afraid to share what you believe on Facebook? I mean, you've seen the rainbow colors. You've seen all these who are sharing all their congratulations and the pride and all that's going on. But you're scared to share anything on Facebook. You're scared to share what you really believe because you don't want a negative comment. It's not that somebody's going to come in and cut your head off. You just don't want anybody to laugh at you, to ridicule you. You see, we have a lot less to lose right now than those in other places. But if we remain silent, the price tag is going to go up dramatically. So how can we stand firm? Well, Jesus gave us a great way over in Matthew chapter 5, and I want you to see this. And it's pretty simple. Matthew chapter 5, verse 14 and following, he said this, You're the light of the world. Matthew chapter 5, verse 14. You're the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Jesus let us know that the one way we can stand firm is to be the light, just as he's the light. And what did he say about himself? About that light, he said this, the light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not overcome it. It can't overcome it. You know, here's a fact about light, folks. 
The light pushes back the darkness. It's not the darkness that pushes back the light. A light will keep the darkness away until you turn off the light. When the sun retreats at the end of the day, that's when the darkness steps in. When the sun rises at daybreak, that's when the darkness is pushed back. What does darkness do? Darkness distorts. It confuses. It causes you to stump your toe in a, in a room that you have walked through in the daytime very easily. That's what darkness does. It, it distorts reality. What does light do? It shines a spotlight on truth, what's really there. That's what Jesus was getting at when he wants us to be the light, church. Be the light. Shine the spotlight on darkness. Where there is confusion, clear out the confusion. Where there is untruth, give them the truth. Share the truth. That's what you and I could be. And so, church, let's be the light. Let's just change out our 40-watt bulb that we're using so often and put a spotlight in. Third, while we're standing firm, we're to respond in love. Can you do both? Yeah, you can. The fact is, many of us in this place today have homosexual family members. Some have sons and daughters. Others have brothers or sisters. Some uncles or cousins, grandchildren. Many of us friends and co-workers and people we are around often, often. For many of you, it's not something when this issue comes up that you read about in the papers or you see on the news. It's personal. It's real to you. And the fact is you love your family and you love your friends and you and we should. That's the way it should be. But all of us know we can have, love lots of folks in our families but we don't have to agree with everything they are or everything they do. That's why you hate going to family reunions. <laughs> I mean, it's that, yeah, I'm kidding, sort of. But, you know, it's that I, I love this person. They're in my family, but, you know, I'd do anything for them, but I just don't want to be around them right now. It's, that's fine. That's not a bad thing, all right? I'll never forget we had a... We had a uh, member of our family, he's dead and gone now, and uh, he was a distant r cousin of mine, and he would show up at, at, at every reunion, and he was just plastered. I mean, just plastered. He was, he was an alcoholic. We knew he was an alcoholic. And, you know, I never saw anyone going around and saying, uh, Jim, I, I just don't like who you are. I mean, I don't, don't like you, and I just don't love you. Nobody ever did that. But neither did someone show up by his side and say, Jim, you ought to just stay the way you are, you know. You're fine, everything. We can accept you just like that, you know, no big deal. Nobody, no, we recognize the problem. Same thing here, my friends, is you can have family members and love them and still speak truth and still be light around them even when you're not speaking truth, even when you're not saying a thing. Rick Warren said this, our culture has accepted two big lies. The first is that if you disagree with someone's lifestyle, you must fear or hate them. So in other words, when we say things like this, you know what the, the culture is going to say? What are they going to call us to begin with? Homophobic. Or bigots now. We're bigoted now. I heard a, a, a black minister say, he said, he said, you know, he said, for the first time in my grandmother's 80 plus years, she's a bigot because she believes the truth of the Bible. You know, again, you're going to be called certain things. So the first lie is that if you disagree with someone's lifestyle, you must fear or hate them. The second is that to love someone means you agree with everything they believe or do. And he said both are nonsense. You don't have to compromise convictions to be compassionate. So don't stop loving those God put around you, church. Be the light that God called you to be, but let's not compromise the word in doing it, in doing it. Like I said last week, as for this church body, we will welcome anyone who comes in the doors. We will continue to build houses and habitats, sending out volunteers, no matter gender, race, or class. We will feed the hungry. We will clothe the naked, no matter who comes our way. We will not question that one iota. And we will continue to share both the grace of God and the truth of God without compromise. Always with love. Always with love.
because you can do it. And guess what, church? We're going to show the world you can. In the days and months and years to come, we're going to show the world you can do it. You can stand on truth and still love. And then finally, and maybe somebody said this morning after first service, I was with you up until this one. You might be the same way. Finally, we got to examine ourselves. We got to examine ourselves. As Jesus said, before we judge someone for the splinter in their eye, we got to look at the log in our own eye. We got to deal with that to begin with. I've seen many church folks, including myself at times, do the hypocrite thing. And we rail against somebody who's doing this immoral act or this bad thing, and yet we have this sin in our lives that we're not dealing with. What did God say in 2 Chronicles 7, 14, that memorable verse? If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and I will forgive their land. Now, did you hear those first few words? If my people who are called by my name. Church, the Lord isn't talking about unbelievers in Washington, D.C. or unbelievers in San Francisco or Hollywood or anywhere else. He's talking about you and me. He's talking about his people, us, his body. You see, maybe there's still hope for this country if his people will just wake up. If his people will take the first step. Maybe we are the ones who need to first humble ourselves. Maybe there's more darkness in the land today because God's people haven't gotten down on their knees enough and saw God's face as seriously and earnestly as we should be doing. Maybe before there's revival in the nation, there's got to be revival in the church. And maybe before there's revival in the church, there's got to be revival at home. Maybe before we expect to see those who aren't his people repent and get right with him, maybe we're the ones who need to repent of anything that separates us from him. Church, just maybe what God is waiting on is for his church to wake up, to step up, and to stand again on the authority of his word, to share it boldly with this world, to take the risk that come with stepping out in faith because you are going to get the shots. They're going to be fired. My daughter Leslie posted something on Facebook after the Bruce Jenner thing. And she had many of her students to come, student friends to come, especially those on the soccer team that she's going to be on, to give these negative comments. And she came and showed me those negative comments. She said, Dad, look what they're saying about me. I said, yes, girl. Yeah, girl. You go for it. Because... If it's one thing darkness doesn't like, it's light. Darkness can't stand the light, but you keep on being the light, girl. You see, to share it boldly with this world, to take the risks that come, I truly believe if we do, we can be the church that was once upon a time. We can be that church again. But you and I have got to decide first, where do you stand? That's what I want you to decide right now before you go any further. Where do you stand? Is this God's word or not? And a lot of people will say, well, Jesus didn't say this about this or this. Guess what? Just because it's not in red does not mean Jesus didn't say it. This happens to be God's word. We've been studying Hebrews. Who's God? Jesus. Okay, so it must be from Genesis to Revelation. It's Jesus' word too. So he did say something about it. But what do you believe, my friend? You as members of this church right now, what do you believe? Is this truly God's word? Or you want to do the Jefferson Bible and sort of take and pick and choose? And this is uncomfortable, so I'm going to leave this one out. And this really hurts somebody I love, so I'm not going to believe this one, and I'm not going to teach this one, and I'm going to you know, just rearrange this whole section. No, is this God's word or not? For you today you know in order for this nation to be changed God wants to change us I really believe that we need God's blessing more than ever today I really believe that because I think we've slapped his face a good one this time I really do and I pray though I pray he's not ready to remove the lampstand from this nation or from his people but I want you to know something church and here's where I stand on this one if he chooses to remove the lampstand, if he chooses to take away our freedoms, 
if he chooses to allow that to take place, we got to remember, church, our true freedom does not depend on whether this country is blessed or not. Your true freedom as a Christ follower does not depend on whether this country exists or not. Your true freedom was bought and paid for when Jesus died on the cross. I got news for you. You got citizenship in a country that shall never end, that shall never know defeat, and that shall always shine the light. That's where you stand. That's where you're headed. That's where you're going. You know why? Because on a hill called Calvary 2,000 years ago, he signed your declaration of independence with his blood. Every drop of it for you. Where do you stand? If this is not God's word, we can't go any farther. Can't go any further. Where do you stand? On the table in front of you, some of you may have noticed this item. It's been in our history room. It's actually a, uh, an old Bible that was printed late 1600s to early 1700s. It's sort of been dated. And uh, Don and I uh, own it. We've sort of put it on loan here to the church, and we take it out every once in a while, and I'll take it when I'm talking to students because it's as it's, it's fragile as it is, you know, the only good is in showing it and in letting people see it. And it's cool to see students grab hold of something or touch something that's that old. But on this table today is this Bible that was probably a pulpit Bible, a church Bible. It's written in German, old wooden cover, leather bound. No telling how many churches it sat in. No telling how many years it, it was read from. No telling how many saints' hands have touched it. But it sort of is a reminder to me of those many, many, many who have come before me, who are standing now in heaven itself, who are those who never bowed the knee. So here as we end today, we're going to sing. We're going to sing the true version that some have even taken out of the hymnals. But it's Onward Christian Soldiers. So go ahead and stand up. And as we sing, here's what I'd like to offer you a chance, an opportunity to do. If you would like to. If you would like to stand with me, and just because you stay in your seats doesn't mean you don't, okay? So don't feel the pressure to do it if you really don't. I want you to just come up and simply touch this Bible. The Bible itself is not a, 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 a miraculous you know, source of salvation itself. What's in it, what it contains, the Word, yes, it's true. But what makes this so special is that it is God's Word. That's miraculous. That's life-changing. But to consider all the hands that have touched this. And so as we sing, if you would like to come up and reaffirm publicly, this is cool, publicly, just reaffirm, touch your hand on that Bible, say a simple, Lord, I believe this is your word, and go back to your seat, I want to give you the opportunity to do it. And as we do it, you are going to see, you are going to see, I promise you, this is why we're going to do it publicly. You're going to see you're not alone. Even though you might feel you are alone at times, you're not alone because you haven't bowed the knee. And so as we sing and proclaim, and I want you to do it like an army, all right? Take the opportunity, and even if we don't have the opportunity while we're singing, you know, we'll give the opportunity after service is over as well. So just keep coming as we sing.